adapting to how to communicate, uh, you know, in the COVID environment. So really grateful for the people who showed up. We do have a good agenda and it's an important topic, both of them, the collaborative aspect as well as the related grasshopper one. Uh, Rick Coughlin, I'm kind of amazed that you're on since you're shipping tomorrow, but you're just a Superman, I guess, and can manage a lot of things at the same time, but thanks for being on. So a little quick context so we can then get into the people on the agenda is uh, I've been working uh, with Jessica, you know, in a policy committee uh, with a group called the Western uh, Collaborative Conservation Network, which is trying to work with a lot of collaboratives around the entire West, Western United States about just how we can work better together to solve really important problems. And uh, they put together, uh, the committee put together sort of a policy white paper about how we might go about doing this. And, and, she, and the committee, and Jessica in a particular, want to know how could we sort of introduce, it, introduce this idea in a fairly safe kind of friendly way uh, around something that was really tangible and real, like uh, the, the impact the grasshoppers played on a lot of ranchers in our part of the world and in other parts of the, of the West as well. So I saw this as an opportunity uh, to talk about um, collaboration, you know, and how we could do it better in, in government agencies, uh, but to tie it to a real issue that we experienced this year in terms of different approaches people took to try and deal with uh, their grasshopper problem because we hadn't done a lot of collaborating and this is not a criticism of anybody. Some people had and some people hadn't and the people that had done a little collaboration and uh, you know, we're, you know, Jennifer uh, is gonna be on the, the panel to talk about what we did here in Muscle Shell. Um, you know, we were able to get a little mileage out of the fact that we worked over the winter to deal with what might be a potential problem. So, so today anyway, is just, it's one of the main expectations or hopes for today is, is to have a great group like you guys uh, on here so that if we can do work over the winter and uh, work collaboratively about at least being prepared, I mean, any kind of control is gonna be expensive and difficult. Uh, you know, I mean, even if you want to do it, it, that still doesn't make it easy. But we would like to be in a place where people in these in these different regions, and at least in central Montana, if they want to initiate something next spring, if we look at another outbreak, that we're prepared uh, and we're not playing catch up right in the middle of a, a of the of the of the problem. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica and 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 to, and to all the speakers because. Uh, you know, the, the time constraints, um, you know, everybody just try and be as brief and, you know, succinct as possible. And between Liv and I will kind of keep moving this along so we can get as much done as possible um, in the time we have allotted. So Jessica, on to you. Okay, Jessica, I'm going to make you the host. Thank you, that's just what I was gonna ask. <laughs> So that you can share your screen. Okay. All right, can you guys see this? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. So, um, Everyone, this, um, as Bill was saying, Bill and I and a, a whole group of very diverse people um, have been joining this Western Conservation Collaborative Network. And within that network, we have working groups. And one working group that I was co-chair on and still am is this public policy working group. And within this public policy working group, we decided to really focus on what are ways that we can help our, our federal partners, especially be more able to join in collaborative problem solving. So this does not have direct um, bearing on what, what you need today, I don't think. So I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, um, but then I'm gonna end up my presentation really with, a, with an introduction to how I go about and how the Rockefeller House Institute goes about collaboration and see if that can help trigger ideas for you all to keep working on these uh, grasshopper issues. Um, 
So we had people from the Forest Service, from from Fish and Wildlife Service, we had landowners, we had consultants, we had NGOs, public policy people, we had a whole bunch of people who were members of these group. And all of us had individually decades of experience with working with our federal partners. And what we have noticed again and again is that the people in the field, the people in the districts are fantastic. Usually the people in the field are wonderful to work with, really interested in collaborative problem solving, but they, they bump up against some kind of glass ceiling internal in the agency very often, which then bumps up against Washington, D.C. So we wanted to see if there was a way that we could provide some ideas for federal agencies to think about, and again, more at that higher level, um, that would allow the people on the ground to do what they do, to have the tools what they need in order to engage in collaborative problem solving, for example, around grasshoppers. Um, so that was the purpose. Um, we had a vision for this group, and the vision was to work with federal partners to obtain public trust, to ensure the health and integrity of our landscapes, and to build resilient, thriving communities. So this is our consensus language. And what we're trying to do is to uh, maintain livelihoods, support healthy communities with viable agriculture and sustainable fish and wildlife populations, sustain functioning ecosystems, economic viability, cultivate respectful and compassionate governance, and, and enable collaboration when situationally appropriate. Collaboration is, we know, not a tool to be used for every situation. It's a big lift. So you only use it for things that are big. But after we all came together at various points and specifically for several days in Sheridan, which is where I am right now, I live in Sheridan. We all came together in Sheridan and out of that conversation, we came up with a number of consensus recommendations that were sort of putting out there in this white paper and then just see what happens. <laughs> So one of the things that's happening is my having the honor of introducing it to you. So I guess I think one of the things that Bill and I were hoping was to get feedback from you as well. So I'm just going to summarize the issue. So the issue was relationships and trust at local levels. And the recommendation associated with that issue was to support professionalism in place. I'll give you an example. I am facilitating the Sublette County Forest Collaborative, which is Pinedale, Wyoming area. And I'm going to be working with an acting forest supervisor, an acting deputy forest supervisor, and two deputy district rangers. So the, the, the rate at which personnel change can really have an effect on whether a collaborative is successful or not. And there is, and I'm thinking of the Forest Service especially now, is that there, there is, there, they, people are encouraged to move around, but in order to be able to move up the ladder, they seem to have to move around geographically too. And we're wondering if that paradigm can change so that people can become more part of the community, more part of the place, more part of the solutions, without being uh, seen as being completely co-opted, because that's the worry that federal agencies have. So we came up with these seven ideas about how to encourage and motivate professionalism in place while keeping federal um, agency staff safe, if you will. Um, then uh, the issue to, co to enhance collaborative capacity within agencies, institutionalize collaboration as a way of doing business. And this interesting is, is language that came from one of our federal partner members. And she came up with this thing of collaboration needs to be the way of doing business. And we use that language to enable federal resource agency cultures toward collaborative problem solving. We believe the following is necessary. So here are six ideas of what's, what it would take because collaboration in some ways is a big shift. It's a bit of a paradigm shift 
for federal agencies for very understandable reasons. But locally, just like with you guys in, in Montana, there is a huge amount of social capacity, I can tell from this one call, around collaboration. You have huge resource among all of you, and you all know each other, and you have relationships, and you have networks. You can use that to collaboratively solve problems. Very often, the people on the ground for federal partners are right there in them, just like on this call. But again, there are things that have to happen institutionally to allow the, those outcomes to be uh, realized. So those are uh, six of them. And I'm not going to take the time to read them all. But Liv, feel free to share this PowerPoint with Tutta La Familia. OK, issue number three, again, social capacity, how to build social capacity to improve relationships and trust and to operationalize culture change within agencies. We believe the following steps will enable agencies in general and staff in particular. And this is more about the hiring of people um, and, and leadership components to think of. Issue number four, sorry, my inconsistent public engagement approaches. So between agencies, if you're a rancher or if you're with a conservation district, very often we're dealing with the Forest Service having a one approach to collaboration versus the BLM. And then there's different approaches based on personalities, who the forest supervisor is or who the, who the district manager is. It just depends, and it, it can also get in the way of creating collaborative outcomes that are really sustainable, that have buy-in, and more importantly, that can really make implementation happen, boots on the ground. So we are recommending implementation of training and mentoring programs to build capacity and collaborative practice and relative management decision-making. Sorry, I'm misreading that in collaborative practice and relevant decision making. So we, we feel that there's training and mentoring necessary to be able to en enable a, a common vision regarding how we are going to use collaboration as a way of doing business within any federal agency, hierarchically, up and down the food chain. So um, we've got a whole bunch of ideas about training here that could insist with that and there too. I mean, I know in, Wy in Wyoming and Montana, in many Western states, there are many people who can assist in, in the training. And then the final issue is policies and agency funding. The recommendation is update policies and fund agencies adequately. One policy we really spent a lot of time talking about was the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Um, I have fond memories of being in a workshop with the Forest Service for about three days in Salt Lake City a couple of years ago. And, and there were all these people who came together from all over the country, together with um, one of the, the assistant chief for the Forest Service. And we were talking about this barrier and it was very clear, everybody was very clear that they are dealing with phobia. So the, the perception that because of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, therefore collaboration is impossible. And that's just not true. On the other hand, the Federal Advisory Committee Act could stand some updating because it was created in the 70s for very good reasons, don't get me wrong. But the situation has changed. The relationships have changed. The way of working together has changed. And the Advisory Committee Act, I think, still has merit, but it needs to update. And then finally, provide sustained funding. I mean, the federal, our federal agencies very often, well, usually have wonderful people, fantastic people, but again, they don't have the funding tools in the toolbox to really get those boots on the ground and make implementation possible. So um, provide sustained funding is also part of our recommendation. So this was just very briefly our white paper. Um, I'm just going to um, 
I, I need to introduce myself just a little bit more so you know who the heck I am. But I'm, I actually started as a in forest scientist, sciences. Well, all three of my degrees are from Colorado State University, mostly in the forestry department, but also in the human dimensions department. So I started off as a forest scientist got my master's in social psychology in relation to natural resources, and in my PhD, I combined the two. And from there, my career has gone into conflict resolution. So I train people in collaborative problem solving, um, and I facilitate collaborative solving processes um, and teaching. I teach US and European environmental policy. So, that's kind of my skill set, and, and that's what's behind that, in, that policy interest of mine is what's behind my interest in chairing this working group and writing this paper with everyone. But so now I would like, I would love to hear any questions or comments or suggestions or recommendations from you. A, B, I'd like to shift this conversation about collaboration over to grasshoppers and your landscape and what if there's anything I can do I, I volunteered myself to be on this panel very rudely because if there's anything I can do to assist you in thinking through a collaborative process that's going to get you where you want to be um, I would do that I would be happy to do that just as a as a friend as a neighbor okay Liv that's I think all I need to yeah, so, uh, so Liv, yeah, I think, so what I'd like to do, I mean, we, we knew when we set this up that we could make a entire topic about just talking about this policy paper, but we intentionally said, let's introduce this policy paper and then let's take a real live topic and, and really engage because addressing that problem uh, will require some collaboration as we experienced last summer. And so we're gonna kind of work in the active sense of like, yeah, the, the, how we do better collaboration uh, in and through agencies and with local, local uh, people is, is a, a topic that all of us have been working on for years through the CMR working group. Uh, so this is just another kind of angle to, to look at this. But I wanna, you know, so, to, to, so we to use our time efficiently and the fact that Jessica is gonna be on the panel and we'll get opportunities to ask questions about that. And of course, giving her direct feedback either through Liv or otherwise, you know, so that the policy group that I'm part of could get good, good candidate feedback, that'd be great. But I'm gonna jump right to, uh, to Gary, who um, uh, I've been working with for quite some time and, and Jennifer, the extension agent, Muscle Shell uh, and BLM, we, we, we work effectively with them last year, uh, but it didn't work so well in other places uh, in the state. And, and Gary, uh, Gary's just gonna kind of give a context like, yeah, what happened? <laughs> what worked? You know, what, what could maybe we do better? But uh, to just kind of give us a, a good sense of what the issue really is. And apparently there's a lot of other scientists on the call who are quite familiar with this topic. So um, Gary, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you right now. Okay, it looks like, uh, Liv, you made me host so I can share my screen, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, I wanna thank Bill for pulling us all together. Let's see, can you see my... I don't know where you guys are now. Can you see my screen? Not yet, we see you, that green share screen button. Oh, right at the yeah, bottom I, I'm, yeah, I'm past that. So let me see, how about that? Oh, it's starting. It's starting. There we go. Okay. Let's see if this works properly or not. So anyway, thank, thanks, Bill. Yeah, there was some communication issues that let us be maybe less successful last year than, than maybe would have been optimal, clearly. And I have given a number of Grasshopper program overview presentations even recently in Carter Fallon and Powder River County. And and they take an hour to two hours just to get through the overview, which is what I was kind of asked to do here in 15 minutes. So uh, I, I was trying to decide what was important to say and what wasn't important to say. And now that I see the diversity of the people that are on the call, I recognize that 
a lot of you probably are unfamiliar with our program at all. So I, I'm gonna have a lot of information in here and I'm gonna go at lightning speed and I apologize, but I, I would like to follow that up with the fact that Jennifer and Emily in, in Fergus County and other county agents that are primary uh, cooperators are putting together follow-up uh, presentations and Zoom meetings and uh, things that for those that really wanna get intimately involved in the Grasshopper program, that would be a good time to follow up and to, to you know, to get involved. But I think for the diversity of the people here that are not familiar with the program, I think I kind of have to go over all of this. So I'll try to keep it in 15 minutes, but there's no guarantees. You can shut me off if you want at any time, but good luck with that. So again, again, I'm Gary Adams. Please write down my email because if you want this power presentation or, you know, or any information, Paul and this, just email me. We're, we're as transparent as we can get. Uh, I work for the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service Plant Protection Quarantine. Uh, a lot of times people refer to us as APHIS and just be advised that there's, you know, the people that deal with your livestock predators or foot and mouth disease or any number of things are also APHIS, but I only deal with the plant health issues. So uh, our, our mission is to safeguard American agriculture and natural resources. So uh, there's some other things dealing with trade. Grasshoppers don't really affect trade too much, but uh, uh, I'm just going to focus on grasshoppers today. Uh, you know, there's other things like uh, wheat diseases, uh, quarantines for fruit flies, cotton pests, and I could talk for two hours just on our invasive species issues that we dealt with just in Montana this year that you may or may not have heard about on the news, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about grasshoppers. So the three main parts of what the APHIS grasshopper program is, is that surveying for grasshoppers determine uh, levels of infestation. We provide technical assistance, which is those uh, presentations I talked about earlier, plus this one. And when requested, we can do some suppression programs and we'll kind of hit on what that actually looks like. Our authority is under the Plant Protection Act. There's a, a site that you guys probably won't uh, be able to copy down quick enough, but if you go to our APHIS website, you can find your way to the Grasshopper Morning Cricket Program. It'll give you everything that you need to know about what we do or don't do regarding grasshopper uh, and Mormon cricket suppression. So uh, some of the information in, uh, I guess I can't hold it up, but we have a fact sheet in there. I pulled some of this off, uh, just a statements that Western rangeland is valuable, both for livestock and for wildlife. Uh, sometimes grasshopper populations reach outbreak levels like we saw last year and we may or may not see next year. We'll get into that. And when federal uh, land managing agencies, Native American tribes, state departments of ag, counties, governments, private groups, and whatever, when requested, and if it meets the objectives of our program, we can help with suppression of, of rangeland grasshoppers. So we'll talk about that. So just so you know how grasshoppers operate, they lay their eggs in the soil. They're all in the soil right now for the most part. And in the spring, they'll hatch and go through a series of incomplete metamorphosis life stages until most of them start flying. And then that's when a lot of people really see that there are uh, a lot of them out there, when they're big and they're bold, not when they're young. So they go through five life stages and then the adult. That's a standard for all grasshoppers. Uh, we could get into the biology, but I'm gonna just leave it at that. They start off as a little, uh, maybe the size of a grain of rice. And if uh, those that are trying to manage grasshoppers aren't out looking when they're at that life stage, they're probably gonna not see them until they're big and then it's, it's uh, it may be too late to do any uh, management actions in that time of year. So there's about 400 different species in the U.S. Some of them are actually good ones. They feed on snakeweed is, a, is an example of one in Montana. So not all grasshoppers are bad. Uh, we have a bunch of Montana. This will be, be a quiz later. See if you guys can memorize that. Uh, that's a joke. Those are the ones we really care about because this, this shortened list of grasshoppers are really the ones that will reach those economic infestations. So the point is, is a grasshopper is not a grasshopper is not a grasshopper. There's only a certain number of species that for some reason will explode into, you know, high populations of grasshoppers. And this is our short list uh, with the addition of Mormon crickets, which is down on the bottom. And I don't think that any of the people that are on this call uh, are in areas that uh, experience Mormon crickets, but we do have them in Montana. So this is the guy that most of you saw this year. And uh, it doesn't seem like I'm, this thing's going properly here. Anyway, I don't know what you guys are seeing. That's the, that's the main grasshopper that most people are seeing throughout Montana. And that's the lesser migratory grasshopper. That's the one that traditionally in Eastern Montana will explode to populations and that's what we saw this year. There's other species in, intermixed in there. This was the worst guy. 
So what does APHIS do? We do surveys. We survey early where we think there might be treatments. Uh, we delimit, which means we make sure that there are grasshoppers throughout the whole area that may be treated. And if we do treat, uh, we will count the grasshoppers before and we'll count them after and make sure we do a good job. And then I'll show you in a little bit later that we do an adult survey and that's our predictive modeling to see what might happen the following year. So let's go over that just real quick. Again, I'm going at lightning speed, I apologize. On the top is a timeline. On the left is a series of different species. My only take home message there is the yellow is when they're hatched and they're little, the purple is when they're big. Not all grasshopper species act the same way. Some hatch later, some hatch in the fall and go through the winter and you'll see some early in the spring uh, when the snow melts, those are not the ones you need to worry about. But the point is, is that it's not a one, you go out one day and you determine what the issue is, you gotta look uh, for a period of time to make sure that you're not missing, you know, these, these uh, uh, populations of grasshoppers that may or may not be growing out there. So in 2017, I'm just gonna do a little series of maps here. We did a survey and that created a hazard map for 2018. This is, this is areas that we might wanna focus on in 2018. So the red is where there's high populations in 17 and we might wanna look a little harder there. So Stillwater County was kind of the hot spot predicted for 18. Uh, and this again is the adult survey. So in 18, when we did our adult surveys, this is what we came up with to predict what was gonna happen in 19. You can see it's not, most of Montana's not too bad, starting to grow populations over in the West a little bit there, but uh, uh, still the grasshopper populations that are significant are, are in one little part of Montana. So in 2019, we did the adult survey again, that happens from July through August, when most of them are adults and they're laying eggs. And uh, you can see that in parts of the state predicting for 20, that, uh, that there was more grasshoppers. Now, I'm gonna go back to this here in a minute, but remember 2019, because that affects what happened in 2020. But you can see populations of grasshoppers are starting to grow in parts of, of Montana. Again, this was just predicting what was gonna happen in 20. This isn't what exactly did happen in 20, which I'm gonna show you here in a second, it's gonna scare you. Hey, so Gary, in 2020, hey, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Could you enlarge your screen? Full screen? Well, I was trying to figure out how to do that. I don't know how to. Hey, let me try it this way. Is that any better? Did it do anything different? It is zoomed in more. Do you think there? I see a I resume see. slideshow tab. I don't even know where that is. So yeah, I wish. Very it's top. Not, there's the slideshow next to anim animations and review. Will that allow you to do it? Well, tell me what the button is again, because I'm not tracking. Slideshow? Yep. And then what do I click there? From current slide, try that one. I don't, I don't know, I, yeah, this, it's not operating like it would if I wasn't on Zoom. I don't know why it's doing this. Because it's still showing. Can you guys see all my little slides coming up on the left? We can. Because I don't, yeah. I don't want you to see that. <laughs> I want to see. I want to just do the PowerPoint like the regular. Let me see what. But but, yeah. but Liz, the main slide right now is pretty big. Yeah, this looks better. Sorry, I could see it all right, but I got a text from someone saying that it was a little hard to see. I think that this. Oh. Right now. What slide do you guys see right now? Plant protection and quarantine. All right, all right, hang on. So I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna zoom all the way back up to the, I don't know what happened, but thanks for straightening me out. Yeah, no, this looks great. All right, no, I'm happy clicking here. See, I told you it was gonna take more than 15 minutes. I'm, I'm a man of my word, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> so, so, so this is what was predicted for 2020. Now, if, uh, here's the next slide is what, when we did our, our surveys this year, this is what actually did happen in 2020. And the red area is really expanded. Many of you are in these areas that are in red. You know, I got a lot of calls from Phillips County and there was one count in all of Powder River County that was not uh, at an extreme level this past year. And I did five meetings down there uh, in September. So uh, the point is, is that you guys experience this, you know, Charlie, 
Paul Grin, who says he's hoppered out, rancher out there, uh, I can attest to that. So this is what did happen in 2020. Now this, what, so what this is showing you is what we would predict significant grasshoppers next year, but there's a lot of things that can happen between now and next year that could change that. But, so what happened? Why did, why, why, what's going on? So 2019, we had a really wet spring and summer. Everybody was happy. We had lots of grass, tons of sweet clover. I drove through that uh, Garfield, uh, you know, Petroleum County area right when it was all in its bloom and you couldn't not see anything but yellow for miles in that area. So uh, we had a long, slow fall. And then in 2019-20, we had a, a real mild winter. And so in 2020, Every egg hatched. Well, there were lots of grasshoppers that lived in 2019. We just didn't notice them because we had lots of grass. They laid lots of eggs. Every egg hatched. And this year we had a pretty dry summer. And so the grasshoppers just exploded. That's my personal assessment of, of what happened this last year. So what does that mean? How much does a grasshopper eat? This happens to be the guy that flourished as a different species uh, because of the sweet clover. It really liked that stuff. But if you look down at the bottom of that slide, it says one grasshopper can eat six times its own weight vegetation a day and I have another table that I've shared with Bill and his other ranchers that are in the you know that we dealt with this last year it's a forage calculator that shows that if you have so many grasshoppers per day for 30 45 or 60 days over the summer how many tons of forage that they will consume over the course of the summer so if anybody wants that you can reach out to me and I'll provide that uh, so real quick again real quick uh, what PPQ can do is nothing and no government jokes please or we can apply insecticides at conventional rates over the entire area, or we can do what we now do almost exclusively is we use this reduced age and area treatments alternative, and I'll explain that. Uh, first of all, why would we take no action? Well, we don't do anything unless somebody asks us to. That's first. Uh, secondly, we might do an assessment of the area and determine that it's not needed. There might be too much water or other environmental factors in the area. There may be threatened and endangered species that we're required to mitigate for and we wouldn't take any action. So there are chances that we would just do nothing. Uh, back in the days, this all started back in the Dust Bowl eras when uh, grasshoppers were so pervasive that an individual landowner could not manage them on their own. And there's a guy dumping arsenic in a barrel and they're gonna go out and spray it. We've come a long way since then. But at that time, they determined that there was a potential for the U.S. government to have a role in suppression of grasshoppers to help coordinate multiple landowners so that uh, they wouldn't get reinfested by just doing little spot treatments. So, I don't know why I got a, something on my screen that's bugging me. So I'm gonna go over really quick the insecticides that we can use uh, that according to our environmental impact statement and, 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 and uh, environmental assessments. That's mouth ion, carbaryl, which you might know as seven. You can buy both those things over the counter in, in uh, Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, almost exclusively, we do everything with diflubenzeron. Dimlin was a brand name. There's other offshoots of, of diflubenzeron now. So uh, we use the generic name instead of just Dimlin. And then we thought that we were gonna use chlorantranilipril and there will be a quiz to make sure you can all pronounce that properly, but uh, they didn't get it labeled uh, quick enough and they're not going to this year, so that's out. And that was gonna be another more environmentally conscious pesticide. But real quick, I'm not gonna go through this. Mouth ion's pretty quick. It's gone three to five days and it's available. We haven't used it for years. Carbaryl has a little bit longer residual. It can also be mixed with bait, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, some people prefer to, that for uh, ease of application and for environmental reasons, but there's some reasons that you may or may not use that. So that's again seven, uh, and we haven't used that for a number of years. But this one that we do use uh, pretty much exclusively, diflubenzeron, uh, has a residual of about four weeks, which means that it'll work for a little while out there. And its mode of action is, is that it creates, it's a chitin inhibitor, which means that anything with an exoskeleton, which is arthropods, uh, cannot, they shed their skin, then they, heart, they get a little bigger, and then they harden up. And uh, that's what the chitin is what makes them hard again. So, the, uh, the mode of action for diflubenzeron is that it prevents the creation of that chitin. So anything that has that exoskeleton like insects do uh, that molts and, and will uh, create a new exoskeleton will not be able to do that. So uh, it's not, it's not, it has no impact on people or cows or deer or pheasants or 
or anything, anything that doesn't have chitin in their body. So it's arthropod specific, but that also means that you have to treat before they're adults, because once they're adults, they have that exoskeleton and it's, and it's far less uh, effective. So we're gonna skip past chlorantranoprol again. Uh, conventional rates, I'm just gonna go through that. If you wanna know what the rates are, we can, we can share that with you later. In the 80s, you know, we used these huge planes and we sprayed every inch of everything. Starting in the 2000s, we got a little more environmentally conscious and we used the smaller planes, different pesticides came about and we started using rats that I talked about. And uh, the reduced agent area treatments is basically we're only treating part of the area. So only pesticides being applied in every other swath. The grasshoppers move around. When you spray weeds, you got to hit every weed in order for it to be effective. The grasshoppers will move in and out of treat the swaths and eventually they'll get to the point where uh, they'll get to the pesticide and, and, uh, and succumb by it. And, and the birds and predators can continue to feed on the grasshoppers while this is all going on because they don't have any chitin in their body. So uh, we can get, you know, we can go into detail on all that stuff. But here's just an example. If you're looking at a plane that just flew away from you, the bottom one shows that you treat it on either side, but there's always an area that's not treated. Here's looking down from the airplane, showing that every other swath is treated. So you always have a, uh, an area where uh, we're not applying pesticides and that allows you know, other, other things that are not targets to, to survive that. Um, again, if, if it's mouth ion and the residual is only three to five days, you've got to spray a greater percentage of the area, but we don't use that, so it's not a, an issue. There's the lower rates for the rats. Uh, oh, I was just gonna say, you can do it by ground, and you know, you only treat 20% of the covers. Uh, we only do the large acreages, so that doesn't really apply here. Uh, for brand, you can use some of your existing uh, equipment. There's a blower that we have that blows the brand out there. There's different kinds of, of bait, uh, different formulations. Uh, it works really good on Mormon crickets. It does not work very good on most of the species that we have in Eastern Montana. And it's very expensive, so we don't recommend a large use of brand unless it's around your garden or some lower small place like that. So uh, I just, you know, if you want, if you want to know more about this, come to one of our other meetings. I'm just trying to get through this really quick. So again, APHIS can provide surveys, uh, which we did. Uh, we can provide technical assistance, which we do. And when we crested and feasible, we can do treatment programs. Uh, like I said, this is one of those presentations. We appreciate that. Uh, other meetings when we try to get together and try to formulate a plan for next year and, and then if you got something going on you want to do your own own work we can provide some assistance next year too. So there's two types of things that are authorized through the Plant Protection Act border treatments and rangeland large rangeland treatments. I'll go over them really quick. So the border treatments are if there's federally administered land APIS is responsible. We have MOUs with the Forest Service with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Land Management and if grasshopper suppression is to occur on those lands and those agencies want us to do it, APHIS does that work. So those national MOUs exist. Uh, we need to improve, as we'll talk about today, some local communication, but those, those agreements are in place. Uh, so if there's, if there's a, a, if somebody's doing everything they can on their property and there's federal, federally administered land adjacent to it and those grasshoppers are moving off onto the private land, there is a program by which we can do a little buffer. Uh, there's some logistics that are uh, a challenge with that sometimes getting contractors to do it, but it is possible. And then we, and we're authorized to do it. The large rangeland treatments are when there's 10,000 acres or more, uh, you know, and the cooperators want to come together and ask APHIS to coordinate this program, we can do that. Uh, it's not a cropland program, it's only a rangeland program, but we can include some crop just to keep the, the block contiguous. So uh, that's, that's important to know. A lot of people want us to treat their crop and that's not, that's not the business we're in. Uh, what, what the advantage is, is that we coordinate multiple landowners, but we also pay 100% of any of the federal land that's, that's uh, asked to be treated by that agency. Uh, if there's state land in there, we will pay 50% of that and the leasee will pay 50%. The DNRC does request us to treat every year. They have no problem with that, but uh, the lessee has to, uh, has to pay their 50 share instead of the state. The state doesn't participate. And on any private land, it was set up for the state to pay a third, the feds to pay a third, and the private party to pay a third. But again, Montana does not participate. So two thirds falls to the private landowner and one third to my agency. And any money that we collect on any of that, we pay a standard indirect 
uh, cost to that. So just be advised. Again, that's something we can go over if you do, anybody wants to get involved in the program. So the, some of the things that we do that I think we're successful with in Montana is that every year we consult with the U.S. and Fish and Wildlife Service and have a list of endangered species. Uh, we have a standard uh, biological assessment that we uh, develop the buffers for, you know, the, the different organisms and the, in certain places we can use dimelin. An example that I would just like to throw out there, there's an endangered plant in western Montana that is pollinated by wild bumblebees. The Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for years now has said you can use dimelin because a wild bumblebee is an adult insect. It's not going to molt anymore. Dimelin's not going to affect that organism. Uh, you can treat only using dimelin in that area or with the brand, but you can't use the carbaryl or the malathion because it would affect the bumblebees, which could infect the endangered plant. So that's, you know, that's some of the things that we, that's an example of what we do. Uh, we did, uh, for the first time, we engaged the Montana Sage Grouse Habitat Conservation Program just for Petroleum County, because that was uh, an issue up there with a uh, sage grouse habitat. And there's, uh, there's some language there that I cut and pasted right out of their letter saying that our grass upper programs are exempt from their executive order. So uh, if there's any concerns with uh, sage grouse, that particular group uh, says still consult with the land managing agencies, but they don't have an issue with it. Uh, we do uh, comply with NEPA. We have a national uh, final environmental impact statement that was developed in 2019. You can find it on our website. We do site-specific EAs, which is where the communication broke down, not getting it to the right people for review last year. And we can talk about that. And, uh, you know, following the review period, we, we sign a Fonzie saying that uh, we're going to proceed. So uh, we can talk about those things. I just want to go over it real quick. So again, just as a summary, we don't do anything unless we're requested. So everybody that wants a treatment has to ask us. Every, every individual and every land managing agency, if there's a cost share involved uh, with private parties, we have to sign an agreement saying you'll pay us back and make sure that you got money available to pay us back and that we plan early. Now the whole contracting part is complicated. It's not easy. We don't always get aerial contractors that uh, will even bid on it. And it takes a little while. So, you know, if I was talking to you as a group of landowners that wanted treatment, I would say now's a good time for us to be talking about it. So uh, we do monitor the applications to make sure that it doesn't get in the water, it doesn't kill honeybees, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. We do quality control to make sure that they're mixing the pesticide properly. Uh, so we take samples every day, send it off. And so I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, you know, we we, we have other meetings, you know, to talk about pulling together a program. I just, I just talked really fast trying to get through this and I apologize for that. But, uh, you know, planning early is good. I appreciate you guys getting all together in the same place. And if you see the yellow there, this is a Western species that we don't have over here. And they, they, that's, uh, it ate this field down to nothing. So you don't want that to happen. I think Charlie and, and Reba probably would say they saw some of that this year. So. I'll leave it at that uh, and turn it back over to however you want to lead us through the panel discussion, whatever. I apologize for talking so fast. Thank you. Actually, 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 uh, actually Gary, you did a job. I guess I'm echoing a little bit. Maybe. So, okay. Uh, can people hear me? Okay. We're good, I think. Gary, you did a great Oh, yes, I'm going to share your screen here. Okay. Oh, okay. Gary, great job. And as, as you said, you know, these local meetings, if they do happen this winter, will create a, a great opportunity to get into all those. Looks like okay. Copy. Oh. Cool. <laughs> Somebody's not so, on mute. All you have to do is mute is right there. So, okay. <laughs> okay. We're all on mute except me and Liv, I guess, right now. So, what I'd like to do, because we're just a little bit over on time, is I want to just go right to the panel and save the questions after the panel um, responds. Uh, and, and since Jess and Jessica and Gary are on the panel, uh, but rather than go to them right away because they've already spoken, um, actually I'm going to just go to some of the landowners and then I think I'm going to start with you Reba and then Jennifer, um, I'll go with you and then Wendy and then uh, back to, to maybe Jessica and then Gary or vice versa. But 
Um, what kind of prompted me to even explore this with, with Liv and others and Jessica is, is of course, the real frustration that folks so close to me uh, had in Petroleum County, because boy, you guys had great horsepower and started really responding when things were getting out of control, but there hadn't been a lot of uh, outreach earlier to BLM and kind of put them in a kind of a hard spot on how to respond. And so this may have happened across the state and other places, but I'm just as aware of what happened in, in Petroleum County. And so that's what prompted just doing this, is like, how could we um, avoid that kind of frustration uh, and create more opportunities uh, in the future? So Reed, I'm gonna go to you because uh, from what everyone has told me, you played a yeoman role and, and really trying to respond and do all this mapping. So I want you to speak from your experience not only on your own personal and you and Charlie's ranch, which was was challenging, but what you did um, as an NRCS person and how you collaborated with people and the challenges you had and what you might hope for for next year. So Reba, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to you, please. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. So I guess a little introduction again, I'm Reba Alder, I'm a technician with the NRCS in Winnet, and my husband and I also ranch east of Winnet. Um, we, I guess just kind of through the summer, early May, we noticed our first hatches of grasshoppers. Um, didn't really anticipate the population we would see. When we first noticed it, it was a lot in the sandier and disturbed areas uh, where we had bare ground. Um, the hatches just continued and they grew and I think it was early June we had our first meeting here with APHIS. We happened to hear they were in the area doing counts and so my husband asked if they would come over and look at some of our areas and their counts were very high um, in the extremely high category. So we kind of asked what we could do about it. They set up a very very quick meeting within a day or two and we had a lot of local Ranchers interested, um, Gary came up and Taylor and a few others, um, kind of explained what needed to happen in about a week period. Um, we, I guess, were very surprised with the, the interest that we had from our local ranchers and producers. The amount of paperwork they got done in a short period of time. Um, I guess our biggest hurdle was that we hadn't had conversations early enough in the year and to get our BLM local offices on board. So we, um, I guess we got a lot of people with them, we got a lot of mapping then, and ultimately um, we're not able to treat any of our BLM lands, which kind of just didn't allow the, pro or the project to go forward as we were hoping to. Um, just needing to have continuous blocks of land treated and with our public lands in our county is so checkerboarded, um, that was really difficult. Um, just going through my notes here. So kind of, I guess, from what Gary told us, the prime time to treat was June 20th to the 4th of July. Um, even with the small group of producers that went forward, they still weren't able to start treating until about the 4th of July, which on our own personal ranch was just too late. And for us to justify the expense of it and looking at the damage that was already done, I guess we felt it wasn't we just couldn't justify it at that point. There was too much, too much of the board was already gone. Um, I guess also just from our personal experiences, we were seeing hatches that were still happening into the 1st of August. So I'm kind of curious to hear Gary's take on that, what, how they hatched that long, um, from the middle of May till the 1st of August, just continually seeing new little small hatches and watching them grow. We did finally see some Grasshoppers flying in the sky about mid July. It was an exciting time for us, but we kind of felt bad sending them to anybody else, but we were happy to see them maybe. Um, I guess we're still pretty hesitant and not knowing what to expect next year, knowing that populations that we did have. And we're happy the conversations are happening with multiple agencies and we've got a much better head start on it for the coming year. And I think having these conversations and just getting the word out, figuring out how to move ahead is very important. Um, I have some pictures, Carrie. We'll see if we can get them to go. I don't know if we need to control. 
see if we can pull them up just for those of you who aren't familiar with it or just to kind of show how severe they were here. So I guess that's kind of at an angle, but we've just all around of our buildings here. Grasshoppers around that wire mesh can, it's just solid. Are you guys able to see the pictures? No, you'll have to share your screen. All right, working on it. Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a, a wire mesh panel there, and the grasshopper should be solid up in the middle of it. Uh, I guess kind of sideways, but that's just a wood fence post. They were solid on everything. Just a building in our yard. Um, this is a photo of the ground. Every little dark spot is a little grasshopper. So then we drive out in our pastures and it's every bit of our ground is just covered with them. The ground just moves. Again, just another ground shot. Um, this is along one of our hay yards, so just struggling on the ground, but anything that didn't have thick vegetation was definitely covered in grasshoppers. Um, so our kids, they kind of, by the end of the summer, they asked if we could have a day that we didn't talk about grasshoppers anymore. And they went out with their little like six inch bug net catchers and their little motorcycles and just held them out to the side and would fill their bug catchers nets and put them in this butterfly container and within a 15 minute period it had, I don't know if it was 15 or 20 pounds of grasshoppers, but they just felt like they were being productive by gathering them up and, and bringing them into the house. I wasn't excited to add them to my yard collection, but go ahead. Again, just, it didn't matter if it was metal or grass or wood, they were just solid. And I don't know if they're a field or not. See if the video will play here. Carrie, did you say you had a video too? Yeah, are they not playing? No. Okay. Oh, you don't have to do that. Just this video. Okay. Oh. Can you guys see him now? No. It doesn't look like we're being able to see That's all right. We can skip those parts. Anyway, um, I, this is a little of our personal experience. Um, I guess as far as with NRCS, like I mentioned earlier, we were, I was very surprised with the, the turnout and the amount of paperwork and willingness people were to try to get this pushed through. And we were successful in treating, I think, about 40,000 acres in Petroleum County. Um, initially, I think we were between 20 and 30 producers and over 200,000 acres that were interested, but again, without being able to treat the federal um, BLM land in our county, we just had a lot of people couldn't justify moving forward with only half of their ranch being treated and having so many untreated acres. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm hopeful something can get put together for next year, anticipating that we may have them again. Um, 
I don't know how APIS does this without other people helping. I just the time putting into making GPS files, shape files, emailing them, getting bank letters, getting requests. It's it's a very overwhelming process. And so kudos to them for getting the projects they do completed um, and all the time they spent, long hours. Um, many times Gary was emailing late in the evening, early mornings, weekends. Um, they they worked very hard and I'm hopeful that we're able to get something done in the future here we do. Oh. Excellent, Riva. Thanks very much. That was that was very useful. And I'm so we're going to go to uh, Jennifer next. Uh, extension agent, Muscle Shell, Golden Valley, and uh, Jennifer played a really important role coordinating some landowners in our county and working with BLM. And so, Jennifer, why don't you tell the story we experienced here? Not that it was perfect, but it was different. <laughs> No, definitely. So I think it was only about a couple of months after, you know, um, close to this time last year, uh, since I just started this position um, last July. And yeah, Bill came into my office and he sort of presented me with uh, the pro problem and actually d uh, did some name dropping with uh, Gary too and just pretty much asked how I could help and uh, try to play a part in this whole planning um, and uh, collaboration process. So after having that initial conversation, uh, I went ahead and reached out to Gary trying to see uh, really how to get started with this because as you can imagine only being about uh, a couple months on the job. I needed to get some names, uh, some contact information through Bill, uh, just trying to figure out how to create that um, continuous treatment area. Um, so it was a lot of uh, phone calls. I set up um, a few different opportunities for those landowners to gather together here at the extension office and round up uh, Gary and uh, a couple of other his of his employees they came came up to round up and provided a casual uh, presentation uh, giving those interested landowners those various options for treatment um, yeah, I just included a lot of those phone calls, uh, making sure to follow up. Um, I also worked with our local NRCS office uh, here in Roundup as well. And yeah, it was, it felt really good trying to uh, provide some portion of that collaboration, uh, trying to organize the process a bit more. And looking at next year, uh, probably right about now or going into November and December is when I will be planning some more of those um, um, landowner and producer uh, meetings. So try to gather some more of those who may be interested in working with APHIS, uh, working with Gary, and yeah, just trying to promote the overall program some more. So. And really, that's <laughs> that's really my biggest part that I felt that I played was just making those phone calls, just kind of initiating the conversation and those meeting opportunities. But I know that between uh, myself, I, Yellowstone County, Stillwater, Carbon, and Bighorn County, all of our Ag and Natural Resource Extension agents, we are partnering to bring a webinar opportunity on December 1st, uh, bringing in Gary for that as well. But with that South Central Egg Forum is what we've started calling it. Uh, that's going to include that discussion on grasshoppers as well as alfalfa weevil on December 1st. So. Um, there again, Gary is going to have another opportunity to uh, discuss some of those treatment options and programs that APHIS can provide. But really, besides that, that's all I really 
had. <laughs> so, so I'll just, you know, well, Jennifer, excellent, really. Uh, I think both listening to Reba and Jennifer, I think we all recognize there's important roles for different people to play in terms of a large team approach to actually get this done. And I know I wasn't in a good position to, you know, um, organize meetings like um, Jennifer could do at the extension office and she had a good network and then working with NRCS on the mapping. Um, just, there's just a lot of players that to spread out the work. And, uh, and Gary was, you know, APHIS guys just really respond if, if we actually ask and, um, and have some kind of a coordinated approach to this. But it, it takes a lot of contact. And I, that's why I was amazed how quickly Petroleum put it together in the midst of it. But let's go to Wendy Velman at BLM. And, and um, I think Wendy's been, um, has observed how things went last year and, and is trying to see how their agency um, might do it a little bit differently. Uh, or at least be more open to, to looking at some different uh, ways of going. And uh, she's sort of in an important position at the state office uh, to connect with her folks across uh, Eastern Montana. So Wendy, I'll turn it over to you. So can you guys all hear me okay? All right, um, trying to start my video so you can see me. <laughs> um, so, First and foremost, um, of course, the issues that Jennifer, or sorry, um, that were being brought up about coordination, cooperation with like the federal agencies and getting them on board. Um, it, it's very true. There's lots of turnover within the federal agencies and things. And that is one thing that has happened a lot with our invasive species program for BLM Montana Dakotas. Um, I'm the fourth person in less than 10 years to be in the position. And so um, for us to get up to speed and know all of the issues, it's, it's a challenge. And so grasshoppers were not on my radar screen at all for treatment on public lands. Um, I've been in the position a little over two years now. And as um, having conversations with Gary Adams, um, finding out that actually BLM hadn't really dealt with grasshopper treatment requests um, since 2010. And then communication and all of those things that need to happen, you know, not everybody was in the loops of information. And so that's something that Gary and I are really working hard to get um, fixed for this year. I've had lots of conversations with many of the field offices to let them know that we're going to try to get them better educated, um, get us some kind of a timeline framework set up so that all people involved know when when BLM needs to be involved so that we can do our due diligence for the resources, make sure that proposed treatments would be um, acceptable in the areas that they're being proposed or bring up concerns like pollinators um, or sage grouse or any of those other concerns that we might have for having treatment done. So, you know, all the excuses in the world, everybody's got them, but we're trying to fix them for this coming year. And I've been working really hard with Gary. He's been awesome to have conversations with us. Um, we both were very frustrated in the process last year. Just, you know, we've got to learn how to better work this program too. So that said, I just want everybody else to understand kind of how the process works a little bit with BLM. Gary mentioned that we have a memorandum of understanding between the APHIS and the BLM agencies. And that's actually, there's a new one coming out anytime now. We keep being told it'll be out anytime. But we were working off of one that was five years old and it um, had some of the roles laid out, but they still weren't extremely clear for BLM what roles we needed to play. So when I was going into this process, I was still a little confused even from the BLM side on what, what our different uh, steps were that we needed to take. So the things that we've corrected for this coming year is I have given an accurate list of field office contacts to APHIS. And we are also in the review stage of their RMP, or sorry, their EAs for this coming 2021 season. So we've got, um, I think we have five or six offices that sent comments back and I'm getting those together to send to Joey so that he can incorporate comments from the BLM side into their EAs when they go out for draft review. 
Um, also on the BLM side of it is that I, I sit at the state office and so like Bill had mentioned, I, I cover all of the offices in Montana and Eastern, or sorry, Western Dakotas. And so I'm in charge of making sure that all the offices get that high, higher level communication. So like the MOU and the steps in place that we know how to proceed. But I'm not the decision level maker. I'm kind of the technical expert that sends the information. So then once we know that there's something happening within a county that's within one of our field offices, it goes to the local field manager and their staff to make the decision on can we treat in these areas, is it appropriate, all the, all the information that they have to have needs to be gathered before they can make that decision. And that's where we felt kind of frustrated last year is that we, we didn't feel we had the time to get the information together to make an informed decision. And so, um, I guess for everyone on this call, if, if you have an inkling that grasshoppers are gonna be an issue and we need to be treating BLM lands to help out with that issue, I very much encourage you to go ahead and get a hold of your local field office people. The earlier they know that there's a potential problem coming up, the, the quicker they can get on board and get the information together that they need to be able to make that decision, you know, help their field manager make that decision. Um, I'm always available for questions. If you don't know who to contact, I will make sure that my contact information gets to this group and can be sent out. Um, you know, local field offices, you can give them a call too and they'll figure out who the right person to talk to in the office is. So I don't want to take a whole lot more time, but I just want everyone to know that BLM, we are on board with wanting to work with this group. We just need to know <laughs> in advance so that we can get all of our ducks in a row so that we can make the best decision for the resources. Yeah, Wendy, that was great. Excellent. So I think people are hearing that uh, you're available, accessible, and uh, if people are interested, uh, start those conversations sooner than later. I want to, before we go to the last two panelists, uh, I know a number of you have questions and I kind of spaced out. Uh, we'll remember this in the future, Liv. <laughs> As we go through this, uh, there's a chat down there on the bottom of your screen and the most effective way to kind of get your questions out and to respond to as many as possible is to actually write your question in the chat and then the panelist can check out the chat and we can kind of go from top to bottom and they could respond respectively to those questions. So we have two more panelists here and then we're gonna go into the Q&A portion of the meeting. So if you have a burning question or just any kind of a question, uh, and we may not have time to answer them all, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, while you're listening, uh, multitask here and also write, write your question down and put it in the chat. Um, so next time, uh, uh, I think I'll just, uh, uh, I think I'll go to you, Gary, and then we'll finish off with Jessica. Um, obviously, uh, we just wanted you on this panel to kind of keep having an opportunity to visit because you had to rush so much through your first deal. But as you hear what's being said with the other panelists, you know, maybe you could just reflect on, um, yeah, you know, you know, some more of your examples of, of what worked and what didn't work last year or what, whatever you want to share. But I'll give you about uh, maybe five minutes and then uh, we'll go to Jessica to let her finish up and see what she heard and what she might share and then we'll go to the Q&A. So Gary, can you? Okay, <clears throat> yeah, I, I took about five minutes worth of talking points here, so I'll, I'll go over them. <laughs> I, you, know, you know, I married a very smart woman other than the fact that she married me and she coaches me on a regular basis about accountability and and we always think about being accountable for things you didn't do right. But she reminds me that you wanna be accountable for things you did do right. And you know, I think the biggest didn't do right was probably our communication early with all of the people in BLM. You know, we did engage some of the right people. But I do wanna, you know, this, this whole conversation I think today is about collaboration and I do wanna talk about where it did work. And then if we can build on those things that did work, I think that is, you know, we wanna look at successes and keep doing that. So I wrote down a couple things here. One is you, Bill, uh, you know, landowners, people that we've dealt with in the past have been engaged and you reach out to us and we respond. So anytime that we can get to the people that we're really trying to help and protect, 
and to keep them engaged and have them you know engaged with us i think that's that's a positive uh, extension our primary uh, cooperators statewide, quite honestly, are extension. They deal with people on a daily basis on issues that they have in their agriculture and natural resources. So Jennifer, thank you. Uh, the Northern Cheyenne, uh, the uh, Bighorn County Extension Agent uh, was good. We have now engaged the Fergus Petroleum County Extension Agent. She's gonna put together three meetings, probably in December, three different meetings. So uh, you may wanna reach out to Emily and uh, we, re you know, I, I didn't really describe it, but I, our whole APA staff is six people statewide for everything that we do. And one of those is an office manager. So we don't really have a big staff. So when we have big grasshopper years, you know, that's all of our attention goes to that and we do the best we can and it's not perfect. So uh, that's all I got to say about that. But engaging us early in November was great for Muscle Shell County. We, we had a meeting with all the right people in Muscle Shell County. We engaged the BLM field office in Billings and talked about issues which they approved the treatments on early. This was in November, this happened or December. And, and my mistake was not understanding that that didn't speak for all of BLM, to not understand how the field, op, you know, the field office infrastructure within BLM works. Now I get that uh, it's too late, but for next year, it's a good thing. Um, as far you heard Reba say that how, you don't know how we would do it without help. Well, we can't. It's a cooperative program, and and Reba from her NRCS desk was completely invaluable, providing the GIS layers in order for us to pull all the the landowners together and to create maps and to you know actually pull a program together because all of that information, aside from just knowing who's got what land, all has to go into an aircraft uh, so that they know where to turn on and turn off when they're in spring. So thank you, Reba, uh, for doing that. We also had great uh, help from FSA and NRCS and, and Hardin and the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation. So we have good collaboration with other, other USDA agencies to help us out with some of that. And as a follow-up to that, our only GIS person that APIS has is in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's not even in Montana. So any help from, you know, from BLM to NRCS to FSA that can help with GIS information, uh, we, want, we want to know. Uh, there was also, outside of the people on this call, uh, a group of landowners down in Powder River and Rosebud County that wanted to treat and the Miles City BLM district was uh, was also not prepared to make a decision and so we didn't do treatments down there. It wasn't just this group of people we're talking about, there was other parts of the state that that happened. And I know we got lots of calls uh, from from North, from Phillips County and the Malta, maybe have our field offices uh, asking, you know, what you know what's up. And it was just too late in the year for us really to do much there. So. But one thing that you guys talked about was for next year, I want, uh, Melinda maybe is still on the phone, I don't know if she is, but I just want you to know that there is no pool of money uh, that, that US Congress puts aside to support grasshopper suppression. There, that doesn't exist. So that's, a, that's not, you know, you might think that it's just gonna happen, but it doesn't. So when, when somebody says, please let APHIS know if you think you might have a treatment, uh, that is more important this year than previously, we would wanna know uh, honestly, soon, December, uh, probably. In the past, we've been able to provide some estimates in January or February, but I think this year it's gonna be, we're gonna be requested even earlier because uh, somebody has to go out and try to find funding to accomplish those activities uh, based on our best guess. You know, nobody's committed to anything at that point in time, but we have to have some sort of a best guess and try to get appropriate funding. And then the other challenge, and I'll, I'll wrap it up, I'm probably over my five minutes, is that uh, we only had one contractor bid on all of our programs last year. So uh, we really need to engage more aerial applicators. Uh, there's a guy in Lewistown that I started talking to last year. He didn't, he didn't end up bidding on stuff, uh, talking to the Aerial Applications Association, uh, whatever. If you guys have any, any contacts with people that want to get on the list to bid on our contracts, we need to know who they are because uh, we can do all the planning in the world, and if there's nobody to actually do the work, uh, it won't happen. So. Uh, we did do a lot of good collaboration, Bill. There's room for improvement. Like Wendy said, we're on it. The BLM APIS thing, I think we're, you know, we're way ahead of, of anything. You know, there are, we're, we've been talking for a couple months now, actually, about next year's uh, EAs and, and stuff. So I don't think that's really going to be an issue. Uh, the communication part is, you know, their decision is still going to be their decision. That's I don't have any control over that. But uh, uh, I do want to say that we are doing some some good things. So. Thanks. Back to you, Bill. 
Yeah, no. See, I'm echoing. I don't know where that's happening here. Well, oh, okay, better now. Yeah, a lot of good, a lot of good progress made in the last uh, this fall, and hopefully this winter. And I can't emphasize enough, you know, before I go to Jessica, that having these plans and this GIS work done in advance. It doesn't mean you have to trigger it. No one wants to spend any more money on a ranch than, than me or any of us, you know, because it's tight enough as it is. But to have these plans in place uh, gives them a sense, as well as potential applicators, that there could be a reasonable amount of business in the area so they could seriously start thinking about how they might, you know, uh, apply and make some bids. Uh, so if there's a lot of people in the region that are working and coordinated and we actually do get another repeat of what happened last year, people are, are ready to kind of go to work and know that there's an, an economic uh, opportunity because there's maybe so many acres involved. And that brings the price down, brings the price down per acre when there's, there's uh, more spraying to be done. Um, hey, Bill. Yeah. Uh, I see a couple of questions in the chat box do you want me to address them or well let's say uh, no let's let's go to jessica and then okay. uh, i'm glad there are some chats because i do see one and, and i really encourage people to just if they know how to do this hit the chat and just type it in uh but let's go to jessica and then we'll leave the remainder of our period uh for just question and answers and, and, and next steps uh if that's okay so Jessica, you've been patiently listening and uh, kind of came into a community you don't really know that much about, but uh, I think we're trying to practice what you're uh, been, been you know, trying to capture in your white paper. So I'll give you a few minutes to close up and uh, then we'll open it up to, to our large audience here to maybe questions for any or all the panelists. So go ahead, Jessica. Thanks, Bill. Um, this has been really, really interesting. And Gary, thank you so much for your presentation. I can tell you, I've got one question right off the bat. We're going into a La Nina year. How is that going to affect the populations of grasshoppers? Later, later. So, um, <laughs> it's so cool because you guys have gotten so much experience. You know each other. This meeting is so valuable. My, my compliments to all of you. It's fantastic. But so what you're dealing with is a continuous landscape skill issue. So this is a situation where collaboration across smaller and large scales can really benefit you because at the end of the day, just like you were talking about Gary with, with um, um, aerial applicators, you can leverage resources, you can leverage funding to make it happen, you can leverage people that you know, um, you can leverage all this knowledge as well as time. For example, Rebo was talking about mapping. That's a hell of a lot of work. So there too, you can leverage resources to do the mapping. So I think you guys are off to a fantastic start. And um, uh, some thoughts that I was having about it is that uh, it looks like you're, you're, you've also got off to a great start because you've got spark plugs like bill and then amazing coordinators who have put in time like jennifer and reba and those people are critical to a collaborative process being successful because they're the ones who keep the, the balls turning and they keep everybody connected and get a collaborative process going from one iteration to the next and that's one recommendation i would have for you all is to create a process that gets you through the iterations that you have to have, the conversations that you have to have in order to get to implementation and in order to give Wendy, for example, everything she needs for her people in BLM to be able to make decisions. One question you might have for Wendy is what exactly does she need in order to help those decision makers make decisions in a timely manner because there's a huge time component here too. Um, I think that's all I have, um, but again, my big recommendation is create an iterative process so that you can get this done in a timely manner, get you where you need to go. Very, very good, and I just want to remind people that um, I think all of you received that white paper that uh, Jessica kind of um, worked with a number of us, but she pretty well authored. 
and any feedback we can offer to her about how to improve uh, what that committee is trying to do would be uh, very welcome. So now we are going to go to questions and we do have some and then of course Jessica had a couple questions that came came out too but um, let's see here. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to this and I'm not expert on how to do these things either. <laughs> Even though I've been on thousands of Zoom calls it seems like in the last six months. But so, but managing the question. So Carl Christians has uh, one, you know, Gary, can ground applicators uh, work or only aerial? So Gary. I'm trying to get my ducks in a row here. Uh, ground application can work. Uh, I think I had one one slide in there with a with an ATV that showed a boom sprayer on there. And the, the challenges are with that is that when we have years like last year and potentially for next year where the the populations of grasshoppers are so widespread that the potential of doing small acres will just leave you open for reinfestation rather quickly. You can't do a lot of acres by ground. So the uh, there's a certain types of grasshoppers that have hatching beds, meaning they hatch, you know, in groups, they lay eggs in uh, specific areas and then they, they expand out as they mature. And if you can find those hatching beds or hatching areas and treat those early, you can, you know, use an awful lot less pesticide and you can do that by ground. But, but that's pretty labor intensive. You got to know your, your property and, and be out there on a regular basis finding those areas where they're hatching and and treating that smaller population. But ground application works, the pesticide works just the same from the ground as the air. It's really a matter of, matter of scope and, and the risk of reinfestation, if that answers your question. Uh, so we'll go to the next one, which, should be, which is pretty easy, and you should be able to uh, answer this one you know, in just a few minutes. Like, yeah, what are predictions for populations next year? <laughs> hey, uh, can you, can you uh, live, can you make me share, can you allow me to share a screen again? I just okay. want to show that. I yeah. pulled that. I, I pulled that map back up, and I'll, I'll just show you. And that's what that's our best they were, predictor. Yeah, we're, we're still waiting here. Okay. Uh, hopefully, this is going to work. Can you see my map? Okay. So. So that, we don't have a perfect predictor for what's gonna happen next year because one of the other questions is, is what's this winter's weather and fall's weather gonna affect it? Uh, so this is the adult survey from this year that shows uh, where there was a lot of grasshoppers. So what we know about a lot of grasshoppers is that they did lay a lot of eggs. And now we are, what, on the 22nd of October, pretty much grasshoppers by this time are have pretty much laid all their eggs. So this, to me, this is not an early, this is not an early winter. I mean, it's gonna be cold right now. So what, what affects the population next year is a, is a mixture of probably this winter's weather. However, you know, grasshoppers have been around for a million years longer than people have out here. They, they're used to this Western rangeland stuff. So winter weather does have some effect on them. And I say that based on last year's mild winter creating such a problem this year. So we know that it has some effect on there. Uh, if there tends to be a lot of snow cover, in my opinion, that actually insulates the ground a little bit and is actually not a negative for grasshoppers. It could be positive. So uh, what, what's gonna make them crash uh, is all the, you know, these high populations for an extended period and then, and then moisture at the right time, making a, a natural pathogen or fungus move through the population, making them crash. We don't have any control over that. Uh, so uh, what's gonna happen next year, it's really gonna have to occur just like it should have occurred this year is that we're out there early looking. And when we see them hatch, we monitor them. One thing we didn't talk about in Bill's situation is that we planned real early for that program and we monitored weekly for a period of time and the grasshoppers were kind of marginal in population. So we kind of decided, why don't we not treat this year? And then, you know, a week or two later, they had continued to uh, hatch and mature and then it was decided, I think maybe we didn't make the right call, we should have treated, and we did, so it was a little bit late. 
but the point to that is, is that we, the, the trick is to monitor next spring. This is a predictor. This map is a predictor of what we think could happen and where the bad places are gonna be, but it's not firm. There could be a complete crash of population that nature creates independent of anything people do. And we won't know that until we're out there next spring and summer monitoring and seeing what's going on. So that's a real long answer to a short question. I apologize. Yeah, no, very good. Very good. So we'll go to once we get this off the screen, we'll go to the next question. Let's see here. Oh, yeah. From, uh, oops. Oh, I hit something here, so now I can't see. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll try and get off whatever I got on to. But anyway, uh, so I can't read it right now, but Daniel Kinka had a question, which is also a concern to me as well as uh, does this application affect a lot of beneficial um, insects that these rangelands re require to have? You know, I, I obviously am always concerned about uh, uh, dung beetles and things like that. So there's a lot of different insects that are really important to us in the rangeland. So uh, you probably can see the question there. I got to figure out what the heck happened, why I can't see the screen. But go ahead, uh, Gary, maybe respond to the question of targeting uh, problems and not targeting uh, things that aren't problems. Well, uh... Yeah, I can, I can kind of answer it, but we can also refer back to our environmental impact statement and the documents that are uh, provided in that uh, for more of a scientific answer. But um, the, the arthropods, the non-target arthropods that would be affected would be something that uh, is still going to molt, if you remember. A lot, of, a lot of arthropods are, let's just use a caterpillar, for example. They're not going to move that 100 feet out, out of that untreated swath. So from the time that they, you know, live on their vegetation till they become an adult, uh, and if they're in that untreated area, they would be, you know, not impacted by that pesticide, uh, just by the fact that there are untreated areas and they don't move very much. Uh, there are other organisms that the, the, the part that's going to create chitin and go through its maturity might live in the soil or might live inside a plant or whatever, and they never come in contact with diclofenzron until they're an adult, and then they're still not affected by uh, Dimelin. So that would, you know, that there's an example of where the impact would be less. Uh, yes, anything that uh, is in the formation of chitin and, and feeds on the, uh, on Dimelin would be impacted. Yes, that's why we keep it out of the water, because uh, aquatic insects are, are affected by diclofenzron. So we are very, very cognizant of staying away from any water source uh, that, that could affect that. As far as burrowing owls, uh, what I know about other uh, in insectivorous birds, and again, I would have to just relay back to our environmental documentation, and that could be horned larks all the way down to sage grouse, is that uh, this is not an eradication program, it is a suppression program. So we always leave a certain population of the grasshoppers in the population out there, and that's intentional. That's why rats is still functional, is that it's really kind of bringing it down to a year that's an average year uh, where there are still grasshoppers in the population, but not these uh, large impactful populations. So uh, we don't you know, completely eradicate. Some people say we want to eradicate grasshoppers. We do not. That's actually not the, the purpose of the program, is really just to suppress them down to the point where uh, there's still some out there for you know the ecosystem to manage on a, like a, a normal year, so I, I that may not be your. If you want, if you want, I can, uh, you know, Daniel, I can refer you to some of our documentation for a little more in depth detail on all those analyses. But I don't have that uh, stuck away in my brain, quite honestly. That was very helpful. Thank you. Gary. All right, thank you. Great. So uh, the next question. Uh, Jessica, back to her La Nina question. I think you kind of addressed that, but... Um, I think Gary's already addressed it, unless you want to add anything, Gary, but I think you've covered it. Well, I, I took someone named Nina to the prom when I was in high school, and I don't know that uh, there'll be much of an effect, but I, I <laughs> what's La Nina? Does that mean drier and hotter, or does that, what does that mean? Well, actually, actually the, no, the, me. the NOAA guys are saying we're going to have a cooler and wetter winter, at least in this part of the world. 
Well, yeah. for the yeah for the winter, uh, hopefully that does impact that a little bit, but we won't really know the impact until we start observing the hatches in the spring. And I think that's that's our key, is to, to not speculate too much, uh, plan for the worst, and be out there early and looking. That's my that's my recommendation for everybody. Don't don't expect Mother Nature to just take care of it. We hope that it will, but uh, we can't guarantee that. Yeah, you know, and you know, back to prediction, I. I, I you know, watching hoppers over the last 30, 40 years, you know, there's sort of this myth that, well, it only, it only, hoppers only occur where people have overgrazed and there's a lot of bare ground and blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, yeah, I, I can maybe get that, some disturbance by management to create another disturbance. But like in 2019, when we first started getting a hatch, our country around here had more cover than I've seen practically in my life. And I often think that it created ideal conditions <laughs> over the winter for protection and moderating the temperature at the soil level that, uh, that because we had done a pretty good job and because there was a lot of good moisture and there was a lot of great co cover with clover and stuff. Um, yeah, that was actually good management led to, I think, healthy, healthy populations. <laughs> That's just a speculation on my part, but uh, well, I know in 2019, we actually did have quite a few hoppers, but we uh, yep. had a lot of clover and they really loved the clover. And so it kind of uh, took the bite out of it. So uh, Charlie has a question. Uh, he says, I have pictures of hotspot area hatches in September. What is the opinion of effectiveness on overall hatches? Charlie, these are new hatches in September? You can, can you go off. Charlie. <laughs> Can you come up? Oh, he says yes. That's new to me, Charlie. That's kind of scary. I don't know. I'd have to see what species that is. I know there's, you know, there's a few species that actually do hatch in the fall and instead of overwintering as an egg, they actually do overwinter as a grasshopper and then they finish maturing uh, the following spring and that's a different species. So I really, to answer that, I'd have to see. But if you're saying it's a a hot spot, that means there's a lot of them, and that's not traditionally what we see with those species in Montana. In South Dakota, uh, there was one of those what we call overwintering species that uh, did reach economic levels, and gosh, I hope you don't have another species that's gonna cause a problem in a different timeline than the rest of them. Uh, I, I don't know, when you see something like that, sometimes uh, it's good to get a little baggy full of them and, and let me see what they are to see what species they are, but gosh, having a hatching bed and, September. That's interesting to me, to be perfectly honest. I, I don't well, know. You know. Uh, Gary, to be to be clear, um, uh, when I say hotspot, it was one of those areas that we had hotspots where there was a pile of grasshoppers that hatched there earlier. Um, so that was as much my question is yeah. this gra these hoppers that were hatching in in September by no no means were the volume that they hatched early. There was there was far less of them, but but, but we're still noticing smaller grasshoppers. So that was my question: is uh, are those a different species that maybe aren't as harmful and and destructive as the early ones, and uh, so on and so forth? There, I I would I would based on my uh, history, I would bet it's a different species, and they are not going to be one of those more harmful ones. But uh, you know things, and I and I speculate. I hate to speculate that it's the same species that's hatching you know earlier than they should because. Because that wet spring from 2019 actually delayed almost everything by about three weeks. And so in 2019, when we were requested to, to treat, we were behind the eight ball because we walked away from places thinking there was nothing going to happen there and it turned out there was. So I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to see if maybe that delay in 19 uh, allowed in 19 grasshoppers to lay eggs really, really late and then they hatched really late in 20, but September is really late. So. Charlie, the best I can say without seeing the species of grasshoppers is that it's probably a different species and I would not have significant concern with, with those. That's my short answer, but I don't know for sure. Very good. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. If someone wants to holler out uh, a question and hopefully um, we can hear it if three people do it at the same time, but is there anyone uh, listening that, um, wants to say anything, comment, question, whatever. Uh, we don't have quite enough time. I'd love to just go around everybody who's on the call and, and ask them how useful this was to them. 
Uh, but it is encouraging to see that APHIS and BLM and uh, some certain county agents are already at work uh, to create a, a, a more optimum response situation uh, next spring if we happen to have to deal with it. So that's really encouraging. And, and maybe, Liv, we might, as we experiment in the CMR working group, how to stay in touch with each other. I was kind of impressed how many people came on today. And as the weather is, if we had done this live, we probably wouldn't, wouldn't have had as many people because <laughs> it would been tough for me to get out of here right now. But uh, so I'm encouraged by people taking two hours out of their busy lives to talk about this. And, and uh, maybe uh, I'll just go to you, Liv. Is there anything? Uh, oh, wait. Um, oh, that's Wendy just saying she was happy for the meeting. And sounds like Wendy's on board of talking with you guys. Liv, is there any closing comments you have? Well, it looks like we just got one more question. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, go to it. Oh. Uh, for the treatments that were conducted in 2020, how effective were they? And how is that going to affect the predictions for 2021 populations from that? I'll bet that's a question for Gary. I guess that's for me. Yeah. Uh, so that that's going to be variable. I'll say I'll say a couple things. Uh, some of our other treatments, not in your area, were uh, uh, a bit broader scope. And and if you look at the, our state map, there's like a, an area uh, in, in part of Bighorn County, north of the reservation and on the reservation that doesn't have a significant population. Well. You know, we, we got a pretty good sampling of the grasshoppers and they probably, they didn't lay any eggs. And I would expect that next year they would not have an issue in those areas. Now, that being said, the, the program that we did in Petroleum County was not a traditional program. I was a little hesitant to even proceed with it because uh, it was broken up into smaller segments. And Barbara, Barbara Brady was on there. I'd like to hear what she saw, uh, Brenda, Brenda Brady. Uh, you know, I, you'll hear from the people that are out there whether or not it was effective or not. Uh, it was a little, it was a tiny bit late, although we, we wouldn't have done it if the grasshoppers were too old. They were within the right age class, so that's why we proceeded. But there was a lot of area around these, these individual private blocks, uh, both other private landowners and BLM that could potentially, uh, you know, just reinfest that area. And I don't know if that occurred. Uh, I think within your, uh, populations, it was suppressed, but overall, because there was uh, such an area that didn't get treated in that Petroleum County area, that there's a potential for, you know, there's, there's a real strong potential for broad uh, problems next year. And again, like Reba, and, and I don't remember if it was Reba or Charlie, farther east in Petroleum County, the, the population of grasshoppers was an older age class. And we jointly said, you, you, we missed your opportunity. We're not going to treat there but over here to the to the west they're younger for whatever reason they were and we, we still have a window of opportunity there so we made decisions to not treat based on age class you know over there closer to the Muscleshell river versus to the to the east so i really it's just going to see what's going to happen next year i think you know some of these grasshopper the species are very highly mobile and uh, that reduces the long-term impacts and the fact that we left a lot of places untreated reduces the long-term impact. I will just leave with one last little uh, anecdotal story of a, of a, I got lots of calls from people this year that we didn't have anything to do with other than a phone call by Winifred. And they said they treated three times by themselves without us on their land. And then those things like those swarms, like Reba mentioned, flying up in the sun would move in and then drop onto their property and, and they had grasshoppers again. So they might've killed the ones that were there but when they can travel those long distances, that's not a guarantee that you're not going to get, uh, you know, something from a long ways away. So anyway, I know that's not an answer. I think that, I think the treatment's very effective when we can do larger blocks, but when we have a very fractured and leave a lot of untreated stuff immediately adjacent to it, I think that that's less optimal than uh, than the bigger blocks. Uh, Gary, Matt, Matt Gomer added to his question uh, just. Maybe explain again how you monitor. He, he was curious about your monitor and timeframes um, and where we need to look. And you talked about that, but talk about it again, because I think your early survey work is really critical to figuring out what people are gonna do. Okay, so we, I told you we only have six people. Uh, I have three professional staff, a technician and me. 
and I rarely get away from this computer, so I'm not worthy of anything. But we also hire, uh, I think last year we had 11 summer employees. So uh, if you've got anybody in the vicinity of Billings or Helena or whatever, you know, we, we're always hiring a few new ones that don't return every year. So uh, when, when there is a group of landowners that think in November or December or January that they are going to put together a program, they will, we will have been communicating and we focus those seasonal employees efforts starting after Memorial Day. We don't even start looking until after Memorial Day because really we're, they don't start hatching until early June. And then we pound it. We're there, you know, every, at least once a week, if not more, uh, you know, working with the landowners, help, you know, hoping you guys are doing your surveys, we're doing surveys and we're monitoring those populations. And, and as, as it appears as though there's a lot of hatches and it looks like we're going to be needing a treatment and that's early June, those first two, three weeks of June are like the, that's crunch time. If we're not out there, then nothing's going to happen because it takes a while to pull a program together. And somebody mentioned, I think Reba or somebody said, you know, we want to treat, I, I've always said by the end of the 4th of July, we try to wrap up with treatments, but because last year's uh, cold, wet weather delayed everything by three weeks, that transitioned into this year, and there was still some young hoppers later into the year this year, so we were able to treat a little later than usual, but that's not normal. So anyway, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Bill, but early June, up until the point where we just have to walk away and say the grasshoppers are too old, we can't do anything this year, uh, or if somebody chooses they want to use mild iron or carbaryl, which you can treat adult insects with, but they're not as environmentally friendly, uh, that's, that's, that's the crunch time, is that early, early to mid-June, maybe the third week of June uh, is the key time to be out there every, every week, maybe going back every three or four days and seeing you know, the new hatches and seeing what the populations are doing. Because if you're not paying attention on a regular basis during that time frame, then your management opportunities are diminished. Uh, no, you, you've done great, Gary, as well as all the other panelists, and Jessica. Uh, Brenda Brady did put in the chat that she did see some reduction. So That's good. Thank you. Uh, so I think we're, we're about to the uh, noon hour here. I'm kind of amazed, really, that we uh, are <laughs> getting this done. But I, it seems like a lot of people are a lot farther down the road. Uh, Liv, I think when we, uh, as a CMR working group, you know, uh, I don't know how we'll be doing our meetings in the future. And those of you are probably might be meeting Liv for the first time. Uh, she came on and then COVID hit and she's been struggling how to connect with folks. And she's been very helpful to those, those of us and some of the planning committee members are on this call. Uh, so she's just trying to figure out how to move the ball forward for the CMR working group. And she did a really great job with this. So, Liv, I think I'm going to let you close it out with whatever you want to share. Thanks, Bill, and thank you all for joining us. This is my first time seeing quite a few of you. Um, I started with the council in mid-March, but I'm really glad to finally have the opportunity to meet with the folks that we typically would be seeing every other month. Um, I do envision this conversation continuing to be had, like Jessica had said, if we can come up with um, some sort of step-by-step -step process for a landowner um, who's the first person to contact and where do we go from there? Um, if we can facilitate future meetings and certainly would be glad to do so as well. Um, after this, I will send out a Zoom recording. Granted, everything went well during my recording process. Um, and then I'll also send out Gary's presentation if he would send it to me and was willing to allow me to do that. And uh, Jessica's as well as the white paper that she had sent as well. So I'll send that again. You guys should already have it. but. Um, Jessica, did you want to add something? If I just wanted to volunteer, um, I think I can help you create an iterative process, probably in one Zoom call, for Zoom call with whoever needs to be on the call. Um, and if, if, if I can help you get a start to that, let me know. I'm happy to do it. I love that idea. We can get folks together again. There's certainly, um, Bill and I spoke about this being first of many meetings, just getting the conversation going. But it sounds like a lot of you are already having this conversation as well. So I'm very glad to hear that. I'm hoping that um, with over 40 participants for a lot of the meetings, in my opinion, is deemed successful and we will likely do another one soon. 
So um, if you do have any comments for me, I would greatly appreciate them for free future student calls. Um, Bill, do you have anything to add? No, great job. Great job, everyone, for being able to come on for two hours and great folks here. So I, I suppose there'll be a lot of, a lot of thinking and conversation, but I'm really happy how it went. And I just appreciate everybody's uh, participation and involvement and, and, and particularly Liv, you kind of making sure it happens. So I'm cool. Cool. I'm good. All right. Hey, as, as, as a final, if for anybody that's on this, that's in that Fergus Petroleum County area, make sure you reach out to Emily with the extension in, in Lewistown and find out when she's going to have those meetings. Uh, by the time I confirmed with her, she's gone for a week. So I don't know when it's going to happen, but early December sometime and, and anybody else that wants to have one, I, I just found that the earlier we can have communication, the, the less hiccups we have down the road, uh, let's do it. So just, just reach out. So thank you, all, all of you, for putting this together. We appreciate it. Very good. I think we're done. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hey, see everyone. Everyone.